those who are students here, we've been looking in the Book of Acts the last three days. This is the last session that I have with you. And it's the eighth, eighth session on this Book of Acts, recording the first 30 years of the church's history after the ascension of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit, beginning with that small group of 120, by and large, frightened, hiding people in Acts chapter 1 to thousands and thousands of Christians all over the world by the end of the book. And the book finishes in the capital of the Roman Empire. Rome itself, Paul is in prison, but nevertheless, he's in the heart of the Roman Empire. And he could write in one of his letters from that prison that all the saints in Caesar's household send you greetings, he says to the Philippians. Saints in Caesar's household, can you believe it? Because Paul was in Caesar's prison. Now, the aspect I'm going to talk about tonight, we've been looking at scripture, different chapters, different sections. I'm going to look more generally in this last session. And what's behind this is, is uh, this. Let me explain it. Several years ago, I was speaking at an event here in England called Spring Harvest. Those of you who are British will know about it. It's an event held every Easter and uh, draws actually several thousand people to a couple of different locations. And I was one of the speakers for the evening celebrations they were having in a big tent. And they sent me in advance a note saying the theme of the evenings is going to be the Acts of the Apostles. We'd like you to suggest to us what you would like to speak about as one of the big themes of Acts. So I thought, okay, they said, you, you send us three or four, and others will do the same, about four or five people who are doing the evening sessions, and uh, we'll select from the different ones you propose and let you know which one we'd like you to do. So I read through Acts, I'd read it, I'd taught it actually on other occasions, and I noticed something I had never noticed before that one of the common big issues running through Acts is that in 28 chapters, 26 of them are facing persecution. Of the six that are not, three of them are chapters 1, 2, and 3, before the, the, the sort of show has got off the ground, so to speak, when they were still in Jerusalem, still in the honeymoon period, but from chapter 4 on, there's only three chapters where they're not actively facing persecution of some kind or other. And so what I'm going to do this evening is look at that theme, both in the book of Acts and then what the significance of persecution is in the Christian church. It speaks constructively of it, not fearfully, and uh, what the practical implications of that will be for you and for me. But I'm going to read you some verses from Acts 21. And uh, I'm going to read from verse 10 to verse 14, just five verses. Um, and uh, in these verses, Paul is heading back to Jerusalem at the end of his third missionary journey. And he stopped in Antioch, which was really his home church in Syria that had sent him out as he'd gone to work there for a couple of years, and then they sent him on his missionary journeys. When he gets back there, there's a prophet called Agabus who comes up from Jerusalem to give him a warning. And let me read you what it says. Acts 21, verse 10. After we'd been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Well, that's going to be Paul, it's his belt. When we heard this, we, the people there, pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. 
Now, when Luke says we, he was there with them. He was one of the folks in Paul's team at that stage. And we pleaded with Paul, do not go to Jerusalem, because if you go to Jerusalem, you are going to get into trouble. Verse 12, verse 13. And this is my text, if you like, for tonight, the springboard for what I'm going to share with you. Verse 13, Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be dissuaded, we gave up. And we said... Uh, Okay, the Lord's will be done. And the key phrase there then that I want to use as uh, my uh, springboard tonight is this phrase, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of us in this room don't think a lot about the prospect of persecution. I mean, we might be mocked occasionally. Somebody thinks we're foolish. We're a bit dumb believing some of these things. But for most of us, it doesn't get beyond that. But there are lots of folks who have thought that in the early years of their lives, who have discovered as the years pass by, that pressures that weren't anticipated begin to build, and those pressures, as they build, make it increasingly difficult to be a Christian, to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, that there are consequences that are difficult and hard and painful. And uh, I would not be at all surprised if those of you who live for the next 50, 60 years, as most of you probably will, won't see increasing pressure on the Church of Jesus Christ in the Western world and increasing ostracism by being a Christian. And so what I want to say, I hope we'll be preparing you for that. Um, some of the things that they faced in Acts, there was corruption within the church. That was the first thing that went wrong, and that was when a man called... Uh, uh, Ananias and his wife Sapphira wanted to mimic Barnabas, who had been generous, sold a field, given money to the church for the poor, and they thought, well, Barnabas got a lot of applause for that, so they sold a piece of land, and they kept half of it, and they took the other half and said, this is the land we, money we got for the land, and we're giving it to the poor, and they were lying and cheating, and uh, they were pulled up on that, and Ananias dropped dead, and the ushers had to take him out and bury him. It was interesting being an usher in the early church. You had all kinds of interesting things to do. They went and buried him, and when they came back, his wife Sapphira had come. And uh, uh, Peter said to her, did this the money you got for selling the field? She said, yes. Is this all of it? Yes, it is. Well, actually, that's a lie. And do you hear those footsteps coming back of the road? These are some of the ushers. You know what they've been doing? They've been burying your husband. And what are going to do next? We're going to dig another hole right next to him. They're going to bury you as well. Pretty crude, eh? <laughs> but it happened. And uh, that was the beginning, but that was internal. But the rest of the instances of persecution are external slander, rejection, that is, kicked out of the towns and things, uh, imprisonment, stonings, martyrdom. The first to be martyred was Stephen, who we've referred to already. The second to be martyred was James, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And uh, there are lots of details, of course, we're not given in the book of the Acts. But reliable tradition tells us that of the 12 disciples who worked with Jesus, only one died as an old man in his bed. John the Baptist, uh, uh, sorry, the Apostle John. Judas Iscariot committed suicide. The others were put to death. Again, reliable tradition tells us that Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. They came to crucify him. You can't, do, you can't kill me this way. That's the way you killed my Lord. Then we'll do a variation. We crucified him upside down. So reliable tradition says. 
You can go to the tomb of Thomas in Chennai in India, martyred in India. It's called Martyr's Mount, where his tomb is placed, and others whose stories we don't know. Even Thaddeus, who I mentioned to you this week, even Thaddeus probably got into trouble. It was the Apostle John in the age of 90 on the Isle of Patmos who had that revelation that he writes down for us, the book of Revelation, who was the one who seems to be the only one who died as an old man in his bed. Now, this should not have surprised them, and maybe it didn't surprise them, because Jesus had warned them of things like this. In Matthew 10, in verse 16, let me just read you what he said there. When he was sending his disciples out, this is the midterm of his ministry, Matthew 10 is a great chapter to read and understand when it comes to outreach and evangelism and going out like many of you are in the next couple of weeks. Uh, he said to them, I'm sending you out. Well, first of all, he just told them they're going to preach the kingdom. Uh, they're going to heal the sick. They're going to raise the dead. Lepers will be cured. And I imagine they got really excited because up until now, only Jesus had done this. Now they were going to be doing this. Very excited. But he said to them in verse 16, I'm sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. What happens when sheep and wolves meet? That's obvious, isn't it? The wolves all roll on their backs and the sheep tickle their tummies and the wolves say sheepy things like hallelujah. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, man. (laughs) Now when sheep and wolves meet, sheep, the wolves lick their lips, don't they? And the sheep run and the sheep get torn apart and the sheep get destroyed. And by the way, said Jesus, you're not, the sh- you're not the wolves. Don't think you're the ones who are going to be running the show and being in charge. You're the sheep. You're the vulnerable ones. You're the ones who come under attack. And uh, he says in the verses that follow, just select a few things he says, be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to local councils. They will flog you in the synagogues. They will arrest you. And so this warning Jesus gave them should not have surprised them when in the early days of the Christian church they began to face persecution. But when it happened, despite all the anguish, the pain, we don't for one moment nullify that. It always has a positive effect on the expansion of the church. Acts 1 verse 8, when Stephen was martyred, and I read this verse earlier in the week about the Apostle Paul. It says there, on that, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Chapter 11 verse 19 follows that up. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, we know there was a strong church in Antioch. Where did that begin? By persecuted Christians, not running away. I don't think it would be fair to say that. But being driven away and going to new areas they would not have gone to before and planting churches there. I find Paul's testimony in 2 Corinthians Uh, verse 11, extremely challenging. I'm going to read it to you. What was happening when he wrote this, 2 Corinthians 11, is that there were some pseudo-apostles, it says, that came in claiming to be genuine and saying that Paul was not a genuine apostle and he was not a genuine apostle because he suffered too much. Real apostles don't get attacked. Real apostles don't get beaten up. Real apostles escape all that because God delivers them from it. That was their line. And uh, Paul says, in defense, he says in chapter 11, verse 22, are they, uh, sorry, verse 23, are they servants of Christ? In brackets, I'm out of my mind to talk like this, end bracket, but I am more, and here's his evidence that he's more a servant of Christ. He says, uh, I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. 
have been exposed to death again and again. In other words, he says, uh, I'll put the passage I wanted you to look at, there it is. Uh, how many times have they been in prison? Huh? How many times have these folks been flogged? How many times have they been exposed to death? He said, I have been in those situations more than any of them. And then he gives some details. He says, uh, verse 24, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That's 39 lashes for those whose arithmetic isn't very good. <laughs> and he says, five times I got that, and that was being beaten with a leather whip, several strands with pieces of bone tied into the whip, that when they lacerated the flesh of the victim, they would tear out chunks of flesh. Professor F. F. Bruce, in his commentary on uh, this passage, says that a man would not be recognizable after 39 lashes like that. His body would be so broken and ripped. Now, says Paul, five times I had that. Three times I was beaten with rods. That's just sticks, just pow, pow. Three times I've had that. Once I was stoned. We know about that. It was in Lystra. And... Uh, in Acts chapter 14, and they left him for dead. He was obviously concussed, and they thought, well, he's dead, so they left him. But he came around, and it says, Paul came around, got up, and went back into the city. I think that's remarkable. I would have got up and gone in the opposite direction. <laughs> he probably went back into the city and said, ladies and gentlemen, I was telling you something very important earlier when I got rudely interrupted. Let me finish. <laughs> <laughs> I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, and that doesn't include the times we know about in the book of Acts. He wrote this before that. So it looks as though most times Paul went on a boat, it sank. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't one of his colleagues. I'm glad he wasn't alive in the days of aviation as well. Why didn't God keep his boats afloat? If I was one of his colleagues, I'd say, Paul, which boat are you going on? This one? Okay, I'll call the next one. I'll keep an eye open for you. <laughs> I'll have a life belt to throw out when I see you. So three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been, in co I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I think he was in danger. <laughs> he said, I've labored and taught, I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. By the way, that's the man who said, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And my needs, says Paul, have not been food on my table sometimes. I've not had something to drink. I've been hungry. I've been thirsty without food. I have been cold and naked. He doesn't tell us how that came about. Maybe he was on the boat one day in the bathtub when the boat sank and he swam away with nothing. But he says, I've been, I've been left naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. I carry the burden of my work and my ministry. Who is weak, he said. Don't I feel weak? You think because I'm an apostle, somehow I, I get up in the morning and I'm tough and I'm strong? No, he says, that's the complete opposite of what I really am. Anybody else weak? I'm weak. Who's led into sin? Don't I inwardly burn? Interesting, Paul talks about burning in 1 Corinthians as being sexual desire. He says, do you think I'm not led into sin? Who's led into sin? And I don't inwardly burn. Do you, you, you not think as a single apostle traveling the Mediterranean world, I don't struggle with sexual temptation? Of course he did. And then he says this, after all that catalog of error, of, of, of dangers, all of which took place during the period of the book of the Acts, he says, if I must boast, I'll boast of the things that show my weakness. Well, that's countercultural, isn't it? When I get introduced to speak somewhere, usually the, 
the, the, the person introducing me tries to think of something good they can say. Huh. Nobody says, uh, oh, Charles Price is speaking. To, oh, let me tell you about his temptations because he, he falls regularly and these were his big ones and these were his lesser ones and these are the ones that are really secret. But nobody knows what I'm telling you. Nobody does that, you see. Paul says, I rejoice in my weaknesses. For this reason, I boast or boast my weaknesses, uh, the things that show my weakness, or he says in chapter 12 after this, so that the power of God may be released in me. Now, I'm showing you this because Paul is saying this is the evidence I'm a genuine apostle, a genuine servant of, of Jesus Christ. Not because I'm exempt from all of these struggles, but that I'm equipped for all of these struggles to go into them. And later in chapter 12, and you know this, I'm sure, where he says that he was given a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Remember that? Got this thorn, it torments me. It doesn't tell us what it is. He does tell us where it comes from. It comes from Satan. And he tells us what it's designed to do is to torment him. And whatever the thorn in his flesh is, he did what you would do, what I would do, what most Christians would do. I pleaded with God, take it away. Three times. And God said, no. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, if you want to be fruitful, it's in my interest to keep you weak. And so then Paul responds, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why for Christ's sake, this is in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians and verse 10, that's why for Christ's sake I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Don't delight in these because I'm masochistic. Or because I'm on some kind of self-denial program that is, enhances me when I'm, you know, having trouble. But he's saying these things come to me not sought, not given virtue in and of themselves, but they come to me they expose my weakness, they create my weakness, but I delight in it because then I exchange my weakness for his strength. I don't know how well we know what's going on in the world today. The British government last year ordered a report to look into the persecution of Christians. And the foreign secretary at the time, a man called Jeremy Hunt last year, reported in his report, the persecution of Christians in parts of the world is at near genocide levels according to the report published by Jeremy Hunt. He said in that report that he felt political correctness had played a part in the issue not being confronted. In other words, our favorite, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Our, our favorite thing to fight is the church. And it's not politically correct to be defensive. And he says, under our nose, he calls it near genocide levels. Gordon Conwell College in Massachusetts said in the 10 years between 2005 and 2015, 2015, nearly 10 million Christians worldwide were living with persecution. Now, that would probably mean Christian of all flavors, but Open Doors, which is a 
strongly evangelical movement. Some of you may know about it. Their document that I saw just a week or so ago, they say that to the best of their information, 11 people are killed each day for becoming a Christian. This is not now Christians of standing. Someone becomes a Christian and they're put to death. 11 each day, which means 33 in the three days I've been here, 77 this week, more than 2,000 during the course of this Bible school, who on becoming a Christian are put to death as a consequence of becoming a Christian. Now, that is, those are statistics that sit heavily on us because it's our world, it's on our watch. But if you put something in the other scale on the other side, you'll discover that God is doing things today in response to persecution that absolutely amaze us. There's a church in Cairo, in the Middle East, a church I know well, called Casa El Dabara. It's the largest church in the Middle East. It's pastored by a medical doctor, or he's a surgeon actually, uh, Sammy Morris. And uh, when back in 2011, most of you won't know much about this, there was the beginning of what was being called the Arab Spring. And there were all kinds of process in Tahir Square, right in the center of Cairo. And their church, Casal de Bar, is right near to the center of the city. People got all kinds of scrapes and injuries, and they opened the church as a medical center because of his skills and background, got the resources together. And uh, the news talked about this church opening its doors to... To, to serve the people medically, get them to hospitals, provide first aid, and so on. A very ordinary, simple thing, but what they didn't anticipate was that people then began to come to the church and say, why are you doing this? They used to have two baptismal services a year in Casal de Barra. Baptism is a big thing in the Middle East, in a Muslim country, should I say. It's, it's really uh, breaking your religion that you were born into, and that is a serious offense. They at Casa El Dabar have had people put to death for that. But in 2012, they had people coming to Christ beginning in 2011, and they had four baptism services that year, double them. In the next year or so, they had 12 baptismal services in the year, the last time I was there personally, which was about three years ago now, they were having a baptismal service every Sunday. Four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, because so many were coming to Christ. And when I saw him just a few months ago at something in the, in the States, I, I said to Sammy, how are your baptismal services going now? He said, you wouldn't believe this. We could have a baptismal service every day. Isn't that incredible? You don't look impressed. <laughs> In a place where it's costly to be a Christian. And Sammy Morris's take on this is that there is a wave of atheism spreading through the Middle East, but it's an Allah atheism, people turning away from all the extremism that's been demonstrated in the last few years with total disillusionment with Islam and many going into secular mode, but the Arab people are a spiritual people and they're not satisfied there. And he said, and people are coming over to Christ. And his estimation is that more people have come to Christ in Egypt in the last nine years than in the previous 1,000 years. That's going on right now. Did you know, and I heard this figure before, but I read it in the Economist magazine, which is a reasonably reliable magazine to read these kind of things in. And the, uh, the, it was talking about the, the, the move away from Islam in Iraq. And in the last few years, 10 million Muslims have renounced Islam in Iraq. And there's an open territory now. They're not all coming to Christ. Uh, 
the fastest growing church in the world, as you may know. Anybody know what the fastest growing church in the world is? Hmm? It's Iran. Iran, is, as Americans pronounce it. They reckon it's growing at a rate of about 5.5% a year, that there's something like 500,000 Christian believers in Iran from Muslim background, and not just in Iran itself, but in the Iranian diaspora, the Iranians who are living elsewhere, that are especially ripe and responding to the gospel. Every new year, Iranian New Year, it's about a week-long holiday. And they can travel into one or two neighboring countries without a visa to go and have some recreation and so on. And uh, for about 15 years, I had the uh, opportunity of broadcasting into Iran in Farsi, translated into Farsi. And they asked me to come and speak at a Christian conference they're going to have four years ago now uh, during the Iranian New Year. And over two or three days, people would arrive not all in one big group, and they would leave over two or three days at the end. And uh, my responsibility and privilege was, to, was I went to the Book of Romans with them, and uh, there were several hundred, and, and it was a remarkable experience. I was exhausted at the end of it because they would sing worship from uh, eight till nine every morning because they can't sing back at home. People would hear them and get into trouble, so they just sang and sang and sang. And then we had uh, from 10 to 12, the morning teaching was just teaching with translation, two hours. And then we had a break from 12 to 2. Then we had the afternoon session from 2 to 4. And then we had a break from 4 to 6. And then we had a two-hour session from uh, 6 to 8. And then that was followed by an hour of singing, worship. And uh, I tell you, after the first day, I was just about exhausted. My translator, who's a brilliant guy, uh, he was getting exhausted too. It's harder work probably translating. And uh, after, on the third day, he said, do you mind if I sit? And I said, no, you sit, I'll stand. You know. uh, but then I sat as well after the next session. One day, my translator said to me, there's a few young people who would like to be baptized. But they don't want to be baptized by anybody who knows them. They don't want this to be public because uh, of possible consequences and they would like you to baptize them. I said, well, isn't it better for them to be baptized by somebody who knows them, who follows up with them? I said, no, that would be a problem. <laughs> so I said, uh, we'd like you to baptize. So I said, okay. So we found a place, little little lake, and it was freezing cold. And uh, I went with them, and it was so cold. We baptized one, quickly came out and tried to warm up. Next one, and <laughs> But afterwards, I was with the guys changing. There were some girls and guys with the guys changing. And uh, as we were changing, one of the young men said, this has been my dream. Another one said to him, it's been mine as well. Somebody else, yeah, and mine. The significance of that is this. When they came out of the waters of baptism, they came out as criminals in the eyes of the law of their country because it's illegal to change your religion. And when you look at places in the world that you think are problems, ask yourself, what is God doing there? What is the disturbance, the turbulence causing? And I'm not going to talk in any detail about Iran because it's unwise to do so, but there are things there that... Uh, I'm aware of, that are contributing enormously to this. I have a son-in-law who's from Iran. He was telling me just at Christmas, he lives in South Africa, where he and my daughter are missionaries, but he was back at Christmas, and he said, you know, the interesting thing about my family is that when he became a Christian, they totally rejected him for it. They were totally antagonistic towards it. They thought he was being brainwashed. His father held me responsible because he said I'd brainwashed him because he'd come to Christ at the People's Church. And, um, and he said, now, the interesting thing is when I talk to my, my family, they all know 
Christians now, Iranian Christians elsewhere, in other contexts, because there's so many coming to Christ. Many of you know that in 1949, when China was overrun by Mao Zedong's forces and became a communist nation, all Western influence was to be driven out. All missionaries were to be driven out. And China was probably the largest missionary target for the Western church. By 1952, all the missionaries had left. And in our arrogance, perhaps, in the Western world, people began to say, what's going to happen to the church in China now the missionaries have gone? And everything was sound, the bamboo curtain descended, and it was a good 30 years before we began to get any kind of insight at all into what was going on in China. And what people discovered was this, that the church in China has expanded significantly. It's hard to get exact figures, of course. It's such a big country. And many of these Christian groups are independent of each other. They can't count them because they don't know where they all are. But the conservative Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, conservative in their care for not to exaggerate, estimate there are 80 million Christians in China today. There were 1 million in 1949, by the way, estimated. Others said, no, it's more than that. It's 120 million in all likelihood. And most of these have experienced persecution in some way. A few years ago, I was in Guangzhou in southern China. That I passed through there for a day last month. But on this occasion, three years ago, I met with a man called Pastor Lam. There's been a book written about him called Bold as a Lamb. He's a little man. <laughs> And he has a house, quite a three-story house, and every Sunday, 3,000 people gather there to worship. I think it's about six services. And uh, little seats, knees pushed up against the one in front. Every floor has a screen, or every room has a screen. He's on the top floor talking into the camera with a live group there as well. But he said to me, he spent 22 years in prison altogether, some of it hard labor, and he said to me, you know, when we started and people began to come to Christ and we had a small group of people here, we had about 30 or 40, and they arrested me and put me in prison for two years. So when I came back, there were 80. And he took his hands like this and he said, persecution is good. That's what he said. Then they arrested me again. In prison, came back, it was uh, 200 or something by then. Persecution is good. And they put him in about 10 years of hard labor. Just about broke him, he came back, and there was more than 2,000 people meeting, and he said, persecution is good. And then he was imprisoned again. And now there are 3,000, and it's too big for the police to do anything about it, because he has become a known figure. And uh, when he said, I was there with my daughter, she was with me, and he said, persecution is good. I made no reply. I couldn't make a reply. There's nothing to say. And then he said, don't you think so? I said, I have no idea. I only know what you're telling me. Back in the 1930s, Japan invaded China. And uh, they occupied Manchuria, which is in the northeastern part of China. There was a lot of cruelty, a lot of battle, and in 1936, there's a Keswick Convention held up here in the Lake District every year. People come to, big crowds of folks. And uh, they had a missionary meeting in which somebody talked about the oppressive, uh, cruel activity in Manchuria by the Japanese towards the Chinese. And there was a young Chinaman there at the time. He was visiting the convention. And the chairman got up and said, I'm going to ask our Chinese brother over here to pray for China. 
And he got up. His name was Watchman Nee, whose books some of you may have come across now. He wasn't known in those days. And Watchman Nee stood up, and I know this because it was reported in two places after the convention. And he got up and he said, Lord, we do not pray for Japan. And we do not pray for China. We pray for the interests of Jesus Christ in Japan and the interests of Jesus Christ in China. And look what's happened in China. Not let's pray away the problems, let's pray away the battle, let's pray away the persecution. But let's pray for the interests of Jesus Christ. And I need to finish because time has gone that far. But if you read carefully through the book of Acts and you read between the lines, and not always between the lines, you will see the recurring theme of persecution. And if you try to track what does this do, you discover it results in something good. Driven out of Thessalonica, Paul went down to Berea, established a church in Berea. Driven out of Berea, he went down to Athens, on to Corinth, and so on. That so much of the movement in that early church was pushed by the persecution and the forces that were enemies of the Church of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to just finish with this text that we began with, that Paul says when he's facing this in Jerusalem, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, you are going to be in trouble, you're going to be arrested, and he was. In fact, once he got to Jerusalem, he was incarcerated for about five years after that, arrested in Jerusalem. There were a group who wanted to kill him, uh, but he was rescued from them, killing him, taken to Caesarea, brought before Felix, the Roman governor, who knew there was no charge to answer and said, if you pay a, a bribe, you can go free. Well, Paul didn't pay bribes, and so he stayed there for two years, sitting, just sitting in the prison, not willing to pay a bribe. When Felix was recalled to Rome, another governor, Festus, came instead, and Paul was brought to Festus, and he said, I'm a Roman citizen. You have no right to hold me here. I appeal to Caesar, and they said, well... You've appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you'll go. And they put him on a boat to go to Rome. He went on three boats, two of them sank on the way. He ended up shipwrecked on Malta, spent the winter there, got bitten by a snake there, all kinds of interesting things. And then he eventually got to Rome uh, towards the end of the book of Acts, and Caesar, quite predictably, wasn't interested. And so Paul spends two years, some of it under house arrest in Rome with a certain liberty, and some of it evidently in prison, like when he wrote to the Philippians, he wrote that he was in chains and uh, he was in prison as well during that time. If you like, five years taken out of circulation. And Paul says, I'm, I'm not worried about that. I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And we have a Christian church in Britain today because some people died at the stake for the gospel. As Latimer, was it Latimer, one or two who, who, who were um, burned at the stake in Oxford? Ridley, one of them said to the other, today we will light a torch in England that will never be put out. Because those burning at the stake were hoping they were destroying Christianity in this way. So I don't know what lies ahead for you, I don't know what lies ahead for me. But let's make this our text. I'm ready to get into trouble. Not just to get into trouble, but to die. If this is in the name of Jesus Christ, meaning if this is for the purposes that fulfill the agenda of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one of the big themes in the book of Acts. And that's why that early church had the impact it had on the Mediterranean world because of the price they're willing to pay. Well, let's pray together. I know this isn't the most exciting thing to finish on, 
but it's true to scripture and it may be real to our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for the safety and security of this place that we're in and we, we do thank you. We don't feel in any way guilty about being in comfort. Thank you for the comfortable beds we'll go to tonight, for the good food we'll wake to in the morning, for the safety of this place, the safety of this region, for the friendships with which we can be secure. But we are aware, Lord Jesus, there are people across the world tonight who are not enjoying this in the same way. If those statistics are true and 11 people died today, not because they were Christian, but because they became a Christian. The act of becoming a Christian was worthy of death for them. Then we pray for those who love them, those who are around them. We pray, Lord, that their witness, the witness of the Lord Jesus in their lives may live on and bear fruit. For the Opposition taking place in other places that is just relentless day after day after day. We pray, Lord, that those there will know your strength and their weakness. And for ourselves, most of us here live in the Western world, in Europe, in North America. We, we thank you for the comforts. But we pray that you will equip us when it may get harder and more difficult and we become more isolated more ostracized, we become more a minority rather than being in the slipstream of culture as we have been over many decades. We pray you'll give us grace to stand true to you and that in our weakness, which you don't want to hide, your strength will be manifest. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.